Hi guys, my name is Stephanie, and this is my co-host, Michael. Hi, Michael. Hello. And this is episode 69 of our True Laws podcast, a podcast dedicated to the dissection of weird laws. One of my favorite subjects to research and learn about. I'm Stephanie Horowitz. I am a legal aide, and I work at my uncle's law firm. Um, a few years ago, I quit college. Um, I do not have a law degree. Um, I did leave college to pursue a, a skincare line that did not go well, um, and I can't discuss any further due to legal reasons. And I am passionate about researching weird shit on the internet and you know what, quite frankly, um, my uncle owed my dad a favor. So now I work at his law firm, Stephanie Horowitz, and this is Michael. Hello, my name is Michael Shaw. I am a law student at Birmingham Law School, and I have been for 10 years uh, because of, uh, well, quite frankly, drinking problems. But I'm not a dropout yet. He's also really hot, and he likes soccer. I saw okay. it on his Twitter profile. Okay, 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 Stephanie, we, we've done 69 of these episodes, and I've, I've told you repeatedly I have Cristiano Ronaldo in my Twitter profile because I'm a fan. That's not me. That's Portuguese soccer player Cristiano Ronaldo. Remember? No, but honestly, it's just because I don't know who that is. Anyway, any hoozy. <laughs> um, this is episode 69, Frogs versus Salmon. And if you've never tuned in to True Laws before, we will each bring up a law and the other will give speculation as to why that law exists. Like what could have made it, what could have occurred in the world in order for them to go as far as to making it a law? Because anything I've learned, making laws, it's just not easy. So, um, Michael, it's a bit like to... it's a bit like making sausage in it. No one wants to see exactly, exactly the process. Yes, it's. It's, it's... got to be done. And so, I guess I, I mean I guess I will start today. I guess I'll start. Okay. Lay it on me. Okay. Can't wait. Okay. And and, and Michael, he's going to give us a couple of scenarios. Um, I want, I, 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 I am, this is going to be a stumper. Um, in, in the past, you, you've pretty fared well, but I think this is going to, this is one's going to get you. I'm, okay. I'm over the moon. I'm, I'm so excited. I, I can't wait for you to finally stump me. So, this law comes from California. Cala. California. And this was recommended um, by one of our longtime listeners, who I'm going to give a shout out to, um, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya, for the suggestion. In, thank you, Tanya. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. In California, if a frog in a frog jumping con contest dies, it is illegal to eat the frog. So any person, and so the actual, the actual law itself um, is Fish and Game Code, Chapter 7, Amphibia. Um, any person may possess any number of live frogs to use in frog jumping contests, but if such a frog dies or is killed, it must be destroyed as soon as possible and may not be eaten or otherwise used for any purpose. Um, wow. Yes. Well, it's, 
it's quite quite a weird specific law it, i if, normally wouldn't have expected this from california because it's one of the relatively saner states over there so uh, i i will say i if i'm reading this correctly this law was enacted in 1957 oh oh as late as that was yes. it yes yes I mean, the, the law that I'm going to bring up later was passed even later than that, and which is mind-boggling, but it's still 1957, quite quite late in the time scale of the 20th, the 20th century to be passing laws about the handling of frog carcasses in the aftermath of frog jumping contests. Uh... Okay, so in California, if a frog in a frog jumping contest dies, it is illegal to eat the frog. Any person may possess any number of live frogs to use in frog jumping contests, but if such a frog dies or is killed, it must be destroyed as soon as possible and may not be eaten or otherwise used for any, for any purpose. Correct. And... I, I, you might have found proper stumper for me. It is. You might have found a proper one for me. I. This is quite bizarre. Uh so what? I'm trying to imagine what could possibly be the rationale for passing such a specific law. Correct. So. Ah. Uh, yeah. So many things. Well, let's let's see. It could be, but perhaps. I mean, this this is not the sort of thing I would expect from California. But this is this would be more something more of one of your from like Alabama or something, uh, a, a religious reverence for the, the the sacredness of the body of the frogs, which would make sense because it doesn't seem to be a law against eating frogs in general. It's just frogs. That have been used in frog jumping contests, which <laughs> that that seems like that seems like a distinctly American pastime. Do you know do you know anything more about frog jumping contests being from the States? I can say with a hundred percent certainty that I've never witnessed a frog jumping contest. No. Um but apparently the um it's an event that still exists in California. Wow. Next time I'm in LA, if that ever happens, if I can ever actually graduate from law school and get this drinking problem under control. Uh you'll get there. I know you will. Get established as a barrister. I'd, I'd like to come to California and witness one of these frog jumping contests. Um, I'm going to say, okay, so there's religious reverence, perhaps. Um, perhaps they confer a certain degree of extra reverence upon frogs that are considered of a high enough caliber to compete in a frog jumping contest. Um... So that's that's one possibility. Um, perhaps there in the fifties in California there was a spate of uh, frog robberies, of, of frog thefts okay. from from uh, frog jumping contests. People were running up and catching the frogs in midair, perhaps, and stealing, running off with them and stealing them. And this was a way to have just an extra charge on the books to throw at them, you know? This is something to put them away for much longer, perhaps. Um, but, but where does the eating them come in? Well, I mean, I, I, know, no, I know it's not uncommon, uncommon in certain countries, certain culinary traditions to uh, eat frog legs. Um, I just I don't quite understand. 
You know, maybe, uh, maybe um, it's my, it was illegal to eat a frog that was used in a frog jumping contest because the in, the frogs bred for frog jumping contests were had a stringier meat than frogs that are bred to be used to make fried frog legs, and so it's just it was just the the state government of California enforcing a certain uh, culinary standard, perhaps lobbied by the uh, the uh, culinary scene, the culinary lobby in California. Um, I'm sort of at a loss for any other reasons. Uh, let's see. If a frog in a frog jumping contest dies, it's illegal to eat the frog. Any person may possess any number of live frogs to use in frog jumping contests, but if such a frog dies or is killed, it must be destroyed as soon as possible. It may not be eaten, otherwise used for any purpose. Oh, oh, you know what? You know what? I think I got it. Okay. I'll bet. I, I just bet that even as far back as the 1950s, them frogs used for frog jumping contests was juicing. Uh, uh, you think? You think maybe they were juicing that far back and they didn't want people eating those growth hormones that they were using in the frogs? Hmm? You know what? I'm, I'm going to go with that. Um, that's going to be my explanation for why in California it is illegal to eat a frog that dies in a frog jumping contest. The frogs is juicing. Okay, so the truth is, so it is tied to an 80-year-old tradition called the Frog Jumping Jubilee. And it used to be held in a mining town in California. And this was, this was passed because people would always try to eat the frogs after the contest, but there weren't any federal regulations um, or health codes regarding the the eating of these frogs, or the frog, like there were no standards, the FDA standards. So they made it illegal to eat them after a frog jumping contest. Isn't that crazy? So I mean, I think I I feel like I got pretty close. It's because these yeah, the, you did kind of get a little close. These like, the, yeah. these frogs were unregulated, correct? And so it was it was it so it it did end up being a public safety issue, a public health issue issue. Correct. Right. Right. So you you kind of get a little bit of a point there. Because it is to keep them from eating them because they were unregulated. They were unregulated frogs. Can't be eating that. unregulated frogs. All right. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. That's a good one. Thank you. I, you know, I, I try. All right. Let me get my relevant legalese opened up in tabs here in chrome all right so my weird law for this episode okay is is parliament's salmon act of 1986 86 okay that's right it's it's you, you typically you only see weird laws from Usually, the, the 1920s and earlier than that, very few in the 20th century, but here's one of them. And to put it succinctly, succinctly, I'm, I am okay. I, by my, I am a bit in my cups again here on the pod. Try, I'm trying to keep my drinking confined to when we record these podcasts so that. It's it's sort of a, a reward for me for for being a, a good student 
of the law. Um, but I, I, I am still drinking quite a bit, uh, uh, instead of studying, but it's, it's, it's getting better. It's getting better. Well, one day, maybe um, our podcast, um, I know we're on, um, that one podcast network now, but maybe one day we'll get to a bigger one. Well, I, I can only hope. And then I wouldn't even need to finish law school. You wouldn't. All right, I so. can finally open up a new skincare line. There you go. There you go. All right. Salmon Act, 1986. It contains a provision. And I'll keep this short and sweet. Okay. It contains a provision making it illegal to handle salmon in suspicious circumstances oh god and what state is this again this is this is in the uk this is a national oh, law this... in the uk oh a na oh a uk law okay oh. illegal it is... to handle salmon in suspicious circumstances it Did someone? Okay, I have I have one. I have a couple. I have a couple of ideas. All right. It perhaps a gentleman wanted to hold up a convenience store, and he passed by a fisherman's market and grabbed a salmon, and put it in his coat, and you know how when a fish, you know, they writhe around. Um, it kind of was bent a little bit and he used it as a gun in his pocket and held up a, a convenience store, but because there was like, it was like, it wasn't a gun. So they couldn't say he was held up at gunpoint. Um, because it was a salmon. So one of my guesses is that. They made a law so that no one could hold up the convenience store by the fish market with salmon. I will say that you that there is a kernel of truth in your explanation. It's buried beneath a lot of bollocks, but you there's a bit in there that's a bit closer to the truth. Oh my goodness! Okay, um, okay. So I we just we just we ne we just need to sift for the gold. Okay, okay. Um, oh, okay. Let me think. Um, okay. So you've given me a hint that one part is true. So I've got to guess what part is true, and then formulate a new story because of that. Okay. Is it because I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on the fish market? Is it because this gentleman picked up a fish, walked over to a lady, and the fish was writhing around, and like he was going to dump it in the ocean? Um, but this woman was was kind of a Karen, um, and called the police on the man but they couldn't really arrest him for doing anything wrong. So they just made it a law that you can't, cause you know, there was nothing to, you know, there was nothing to arrest this guy for. He, they, oh, he was just well, being you, suspicious. And are so- you, Are you saying the salmon was in his trousers and that's what made it suspicious? Is that why I'm hearing? I, uh, he put I the salmon in his trousers. I don't and went think over so. And I, I think the, the, that the Karen just wanted to call the police on that guy. And the only thing they could pin on him was that he was holding a salmon. And so they, she said that this guy was holding a salmon suspiciously next to her in a suspicious manner. And so because of that, they couldn't arrest him, but they made it a law to, that you couldn't handle salmon suspiciously. Okay. Okay. Um, you're, you're definitely thinking along the, the correct lines of it, it, that he's hand, he's 
handling salmon in a suspicious circumstance. That's absolutely true. Um, you just need to to pare it down a little bit further. Okay. And it, it, you mentioned again a part of your scenario was exactly like the first one you mentioned. Well, the th it's the, the similar is that both men were handling the salmon suspiciously. Right, right. Um, it's it's just the the nature of the suspicious circumstance. Well, those were my two guesses. Okay, th are you, you those are going to be your two? Yep, those are my two. Okay, I'm, I'm so ready to hear the truth. Okay, so uh, first of all, the uh, the provision making it illegal to handle salmon in a suspicious in suspicious circumstances, it's it's only one section of the Salmon Act of 1986. Um, the act contains 43 paragraphs dealing with a wide range of detailed matters relating to salmon fishery. So it's sort of a broad um, re regulatory bill dealing with salmon fisheries and on a number of different uh, 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 issues. Um, uh, for instance, for, for instance, there's uh, the definition and registration of a salmon fishery, uh, the, the legal regulation of close seasons on such fisheries and the constitution and governance of salmon fishery boards, uh, regulations of the methods allowed for salmon fishing, specifically giving the Secretary of State the power to define what is meant by various forms of net fishing and regulation of the trade in salmon, salmon dealers. Um, it's a, it's a, sort of a uh, updating of Victorian era uh, regulation of, the sal of uh, salmon fishing in the UK. Um, specifically, Section 32 of the Act is headed Handling Salmon in Suspicious Circumstances. This section creates an offence in England, in Wales, and Scotland of any person who receives or disposes of any salmon in circumstances where they believe or could reasonably believe that the salmon has been illegally fished. Essentially, this is a provision aimed at reducing salmon poaching by making handling of poached salmon a criminal offence. And in, and just to give you uh, some context into uh, scenarios they had in mind, uh, the general idea is that it is illegal to take possession of or dispose of any salmon in uh, circumstances where the individual concerned believes or could reasonably believe that salmon has been illegally fished, i.e. poached or stolen, which is why I was saying what you were getting at was so close is the, the 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 gentleman taking the salmon and hiding it in his coat pocket you know yeah yeah that's that is yeah. specifically something that they yeah. would have in mind i just kind of that, went with like him being suspicious with the salmon i kind of I, I would say if a man if a man's got salmon in his coat and sort of wrapped up in paper that is true uh, that why is would you kind why of suspicious. would you why would you carry your salmon that way? It's just going to get, make it warm before you get home. Ugh, yeah, not, nobody wants keep warm it cool. salmon. Um, uh, that is, buy your salmon from, from official fisheries through official channels. Don't try and buy it from some shady guy in the pub. And if you're sh a shady guy in the pub, yeah, it's illegal to try and sell your shady salmon. Uh, the idea is to make it difficult to make stolen salmon difficult to sell, ensuring that the fisheries can operate without fear of theft. And uh, uh, another interesting little tidbit, uh, the salmon apparently shed scales when caught. So if a bailiff or fisheries officer discovers salmon scales in your boat, car, or on your clothes, it is obvious that you have handled salmon. Salmon licenses are expensive and poaching is common, so they have good reason to suspect you have been poaching if you have no license, but the scales are present. The veritable scales of justice. Nice. Well, guys, before we conclude today's podcast, I do want to take a moment to shout out um, this week's sponsor, um, Illegal Zooms. 
Hey, legal seagulls, looking for a cheap new media device that you don't have to worry too much about breaking while you're working out or going for a job? No, no, cheaper than that, even. We're here to tell you about IllegalZunes.Onion, the world's, the dark web's top purveyor of questionably obtained and questionably obsolete consumer technology. If you don't mind a few dings, cracks, scratches, or speckles of blood, Illegal Zunes can be your one-stop shop for MP3 players you wouldn't mind breaking at the gym, burner phones, and pages and pagers for your budding bud business in the states that they still haven't legalized yet. Or maybe you just need a former possession of someone of someone stabbed to death for 10 years ago in an alley in Bangkok so you can perform some kind of black magic ritual. Shipping is free, but we strongly recommend you use a P.O. box. Check out illegalzoons.onion slash true laws for 10% off your first Beijing Blackberry today. Right. And that Brilliant. concludes this week's version of true crime or true laws. This has been Stephanie. And I'm Michael, and we will see you in court.